Hello. Hi, everyone. Okay, thanks for coming. And uh, finally, today is our last day of lecture. So, yeah, so we uh, will cover the rest uh, of the generative models part. Um, mainly about the pix to pix based style transfer models, uh, continuing from last uh, lecture. So, okay, so let's start. So yeah, we might finish a little bit earlier today. Um, so yeah, let's see. In the last lecture, we uh, have seen the uh, pix to pix model. Basically, we map uh, image into another uh, by, um, by um, preserving its contents, but just changing the style. For example, from uh, area maps to just regular map or vice versa, or uh, what else? Yeah, there were a lot of interesting um, um, applications or examples, like uh, we draw something and then map it to uh, row, uh, like from sketch to actual product or the other way. Uh, actually, we have seen a lot of interesting applications on the web. So um, at the last, at the um, conclusion part of last model, we actually have seen that um, the limitations of the previous model, pix to pix, was uh, it requires uh, paired images for uh, training, which means we have to have a paired uh, image of one domain and the other which is um, having exactly the same um, same uh, semantics. And otherwise, we are not able to train this uh, pix to pix model. That was the biggest limitation, especially if we have, uh, it's, it's hard, if it's hard to have some paired image, images uh, between the domain A and domain B. So we are going to see uh, another approach which we can actually use for that kind of situation. So. Uh, I'm going to show two models. One is called Cyclegan, and the other is called Discogan. Actually, those two models are almost the same. Almost exact. Just the uh, idea, general idea, is exactly the same. Only the implementation details were slightly different. So we are going to uh, discuss this uh, broad idea and how they apply that idea to actual experiments. So. Um, the goal of Cyclegan or Discogan is uh, unpaired image to image translation using cycle consistency. So let's see what it is. So the, uh, their goal is basically overcoming the main drawback of the pix to pix, which was uh, we were requiring the paired images for training, but now they um, design something that we don't have to. So in this problem setting, we have some images on domain X and another set of images in domain Y. For example, domain X is uh, photos of uh, some natural scenes, like cities or the mountains, or uh, just uh, real photos. And the other is uh, the other domain is some pictures drawn by some famous uh, uh, artists, like Monet or I don't know, uh, some, some artists, uh, their own uh, drawing styles, not real photos. But they usually, uh, for example, they um, look at actual scene and they just draw it. Then its style is different from the uh, the real photos, but we can realize that they are actually uh, describing the same scene. So we don't have to have the paired examples actually uh, describing the exactly same scene in the photos and uh, in the Monet style. But we just want to uh, transform between these two domains. And what we need with this cycle again is just a set of images in domain X, which is the photos, and uh, another set of images in domain Y, which is just collection of uh, Monet's artworks. So then we apply these two things. Uh, one is the adversarial loss, which is the same as uh, pix to pix we have done the last time. But uh, at the same time, we'd like to have this uh, cycle consistency. So let's see what they mean uh, in the next slides. So, uh, okay, yeah, let's see. This one is actually uh, explains it much easier. So we have a domain X, which is a photo of horse, and domain Y is a set of 
pic uh, pictures with zebra. And we'd like to transform this horse to a zebra. So except for this uh, horse part, the rest, uh, the background needs to stay the same. And only this uh, horse just changes its color to zebra, something like this. So our generator from X to Y is trained to do this. So uh, our goal is uh, training this um, generator when it receives this as an input. It outputs actually de uh, by detecting this uh, horse area and changing the color of it to like zebra style like this. So it's uh, our generator, which is uh, transferring domain X to domain Y. And then we apply some adversary loss, which is uh, this dy, the uh, discriminator for the y domain, uh, figure out if it's real zebra scene or it's fake image, which is transformed from the regular horse. So this discriminator is trained to figure out if this is real or fake. And this generator gx to y and dy will fight to each other to improve themselves. This is exactly the same as our uh, GAN setting in the last lecture. And then you may ask that, uh, then how can we train this G, X to Y? So uh, because we don't have the paired ground truth image of zebra like this, we train another uh, generator from Y to X. So now we have this uh, zebra and then we transit, uh, transfer it back to the horse domain. So this generator is trained to do the opposite thing of this GX to Y. Given the zebra image, it needs to transform it to regular horse image. And once these two generator works as intended, then we expect that these two horse images should be same or at least similar. So that is called um, cycle consistency loss. We compare these two images pixel wise and we want to have the same uh, images. That's how we are going to train these models. So this cycle consistency loss is necessary because uh, if we only have this adversary loss, then uh, how can this generator can cheat? It doesn't have to transform a horse to a zebra, but it just memorize some zebra image and just outputs the same thing again and again all the time. Then this adversary, uh, this discriminator will be just fooled. Okay, that looks like a zebra, so it's okay. But we also want to have this exact the same shape of the horse uh, in just zebra color. So if we don't have this cycle consistency loss, we uh, cannot achieve uh, sending this to zebra domain and coming back uh, by uh, preserving its uh, shape or size or uh, orientation, everything. So that's why we need this uh, cycle consistency. And we can actually do this. We actually have to do this with uh, images from zebra to horse as well. So now we have the ground truth image, the real image of zebra in the Y domain. And we do the same thing. Using this uh, generator from Y to X, we generate an image of horse from this with exactly the same shape and uh, same orientation, everything should be the same, only the color changes or the style changes. And then another adversarial loss, uh, another discriminator in X domain now uh, determines if this is a fake or real image in X domain. And then we send it back to uh, the zebra domain. Then we also expect that these two zebras are uh, describing the same thing. I mean, uh, pixel-wise, they should be exactly the same. So we apply this cycle consistency loss again to compare these two should be the same. And we repeat these experiments, uh, this training, with uh, examples generate uh, starting from the domain X to Y and coming back to X, and also y from, uh, from Y to X and coming back to Y. And we just repeat them multiple uh, times using different images to train these uh, two generators and two discriminators, okay? So let's see its objective functions. So we have uh, the generator and the discriminator, but generator actually have two versions from X to Y and Y to X. And uh, let's see. So for this uh, Y domain, we uh, 
have the real images from Y, real Y. So this discriminator is trained to output large values, or in this case, it's uh, from zero to one. So we like to have larger outputs for uh, the images in the rear uh, images of the Y domain. And at the same time, this, this, this discriminator tries to maximize this score by assigning lower scores for uh, fake images, which is actually what it was X domain image, but it was transformed by this, uh, this generator from X to Y. So this is a fake image. And given this fake image, our discriminator Y wants to uh, output lower values. So that is uh, how we are going to train this DY, these two terms, which is exactly the same as our uh, GAN setting before, right? And then, what about the generator? The goal of this generator is starting from this X image, it transfers it to Y domain, and it tries to minimize this score by fooling dy to uh, say this is a real image, even if it's a fake. So that is the goal of this generator. So these three laws are uh, actually just the same thing from the uh, original GAN, so nothing new here. But now we have uh, cycle consistency loss added here. So let's see. Starting from x, some x domain image, we send it to y domain uh, using the generator of x to y. And then that image is fed into another generator from y to x. Then we expect that this will be the same as x, the original input x, right? So that's what we want to do here. So both G, which means uh, these two, try to minimize this term by generating real-like images uh, in each domain. And eventually, it uh, needs to generate back the original input image x. So this part is uh, describing the cycle consistency loss. OK? And there is a dual loss function. This, this one is actually describing only from x to y and then to x. But we also do the other way, from y to x and then uh, to y. So that should be in the exactly the same format. But these uh, dy's will be dx, and the order of these will be different. So from generator y to x, having a y as input, and then x to y here, and then it co uh, compares to the original image in y. So it's just a dual. Uh, they do both at the same time. OK? Quite clever idea, right? So uh, that's the just main idea of this model. And this part is just the implementation details. So um, they used a uh, generator, uh, uh, consists of uh, ResNet. And uh, thanks to the residual connections, their uh, information loss was minimized. And for discriminator, they used patch gun, which was uh, introduced in picks to picks uh, using the 70 by 70 patches. And these are some minor details they have tried. So. Uh, LS GAN or uh, least square GAN uh, is instead of using the cross entropy, they apply these uh, squared loss uh, as an output of these uh, for the output of these discriminators. So where originally it was like this, uh, right? We uh, expect that this dy outputs one or larger values, and for this one, it we want it to output smaller values. The philosophy is the same, but uh, the form of the loss function just changes to squared loss. And they argue that this one was actually useful to avoid vanishing gradients. So it's just uh, minor improvements. And uh, they also say that they have uh, used the identity loss. So what if we feed real y to the generator of x to y? So the goal of generator x to y expects to receive some images in domain x and transform it to domain y, right? But what if we feed some image is already in y? Then we expect that this g doesn't do anything. It just outputs the exact uh, input because it's already in y, right? So they actually did that. Uh, and they said that it's useful. It's uh, trivial, but if they don't, then uh, it, this one actually uh, might do something weird. I don't know. So uh, yeah, this one is they added uh, as a minor additional loss function. 
So here are some examples. Uh, so this one is from uh, real photo to uh, some image, art image, and then uh, coming back to real photo. So this reconstructed image is slightly different from the photos, but it's less like this uh, artist uh, artistic work. And this one is describing the uh, horse to zebra and then coming back to horse. So we see that actually they are working quite well. And these are, uh, I don't know, this is from far to summer and then coming back to far, or winter to summer and coming back to winter, maybe. This is the snow. And this is interesting. So from uh, area images like this uh, and coming back to map and then uh, back to the area image. So without cycle consistency, this one will not be able to recover the details of these maps, right? The just with, uh, if we just have the adverse real loss, then uh, it will still output some area image-like output images, but uh, these raw details may be missing because uh, when we just map by the generator, then uh, it doesn't have to uh, satisfy the details uh, of these uh, maps uh, if we don't uh, send it back to the original domain and minimize uh, the pixel-wise loss function using the cycle consistency, all right? Another uh, set of examples uh, where actually you can be more creative to think about other interesting uh, applications in this area. So this one is uh, sending some smartphone photos to DSLR-like uh, photos. So you don't have to buy expensive DSLR cameras uh, if you have this kind of app. So you, ca you can collect photos from your smartphones, like thousands or tens of thousands of images. And you also just download some DSLR photos from the internet and you train this model and you can make a, an, an app and you can just take your smartphone photos, then it can transform it to DSLR-like photos. So this one is kind of interesting uh, applications. And all of these are uh, uh, the transform between the photos and some artistic works by different uh, artists, like Monet, Van Gogh, uh, Cezanne, or Ukiyo-e. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. So this was the cycle again. So let's summarize uh, this model. Their contribution is uh, enab they enabled uh, the star transform without paired images. This is really a uh, tough condition uh, because we already, always had to have the paired images in the training data set, which is really restrictive, but they kind of uh, resolved that issue. So now uh, we can train our uh, transformation between arbitrary two domains. And uh, their uh, result resulting images were like uh, high resolution, as you have seen here, uh, their, their output image is quite in uh, good quality and working well for style transform. Their limitation is uh, this. When they just change the style, so the shape is the same, but they just change the colors or uh, some little bit of detailed uh, textures or styles, it worked really well. But if they have to change the shape entirely, like from apple to orange or from cat to dog, it never works. Where it, I would say well, it works, but it's uh, underperforming. It uh, looks weird. So you see that uh, from this apple to orange, uh, you s still see some uh, boundary of the original apple here, or where this, uh, I don't know what it should be. Uh, maybe it tries to uh, transform from cat to dog, but it's not a cat and also it's not a dog, which is, uh, yeah. So. This uh, shape change was uh, limited by this cycle again. But in theory, they, uh, they also should be able to do this. And actually what is uh, what can uh, achieve that is this one, disco again. Disco again stands for discover again. And that is using exactly the same idea as the cycle again. And that was concurrently developed by uh, SKT Brain in Korea. So, uh, the first author of this paper uh, was uh, scouted by Facebook after he uh, published this paper. So where I would encourage you to uh, publish some paper like this and only with just one paper and master's degree, you can go anywhere you would like to work. 
like uh, visa doesn't matter. They just scout you and uh, they will pay you like uh, several hundreds of dollars, thousands of dollars. So yeah, this one actually shows um, quite interesting idea, but uh, unfortunately they uh, concurrently developed by, uh, with Cycle again, and they had to kind of uh, split the credit. Uh, and Cycle again was more popular, unfortunately, but yeah. Uh, anyway, so the main idea is the same, just sending an image to another domain and coming back and use the cycle consistency, and also using the uh, GAN uh, adversarial loss, and that's it. So the main difference is uh, the detailed implementation and the, the model structures and just minor details were different. But just because of that, uh, their experiment is quite different, actually. So the details, uh, model architectures, they used um, something similar to the convolution network. Like uh, they say that it's encoder decoder structure. So it's kind of common in this kind of generative models. And um, they reduce the size of output significantly. In CycleGAN, it was like 512 by uh, 512, which is quite huge image. But they experimented with only a uh, small size patch, like 64 by 64. And they used quite lighter models. So they um, sacrificed the image quality which was uh, achieved by the cycle again. But at the same time, because of that lighter models, they were able to uh, train the models much quickly and it's uh, more flexibly used to uh, shape changes. So let's see the examples here. This one uh, is from back to shoes, and this is from shoes to back. So this kind of shape change was not possible with cycle again even though their output image uh, quality was really good. So here, uh, given this uh, handbag styles, uh, it transforms to uh, the shoes. It's quite makes sense and uh, might be useful if you'd like to buy some uh, shoes, which is uh, fits well with your uh, bags or your shirts or whatever. And um, this chair to car or car to face experiment shows that uh, it can be also used for um, uh, the orientation or the direction of uh, uh, where you're actually looking at. So uh, the input is given like this, a list of chairs uh, from uh, looking at different directions. And then uh, it generates the image of out, uh, the car uh, with the same orientation. So. This is also an interesting application. Are you guys okay? Uh, I mean, the internet connection seems to be very slow now. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Thank you. Uh, for some reason, I can't see your face. Usually that happens, uh, the connection is bad, okay. OK, you guys are coming back. Cool. OK, so that's the end of Disco GAN. And the next model is uh, Stargun uh, or Stargan. So uh, let's see the uh, limitation of the, the Cycle GAN or Disco GAN. In Cycle GAN or Disco GAN, we have, we have to have the collection of the images in domain X and domain Y. And we learn to transform between them, right? What about the case that we have multiple domains, more than two? For example, like this, uh, we have four domains, and then we'd like to transform one image to any other uh, domain uh, if flexibly. So in this case, if we just use this uh, cycle again or disco again, we have to train the generator and the discriminator for all the domains separately. Right from uh, one to two, two to one, and three to one, one to three, and two to four, four to two. All of the combinations we have to train the generator from uh, one way to uh, another. Right. The main idea of Stargan is uh, having just one uh, common model, and we can generate uh, images in any other domain by just specifying them. So you can just give this image from domain one. And uh, I would like to, uh, for example, create an image in domain two. Then it outputs this one. But if you want to uh, generate an image from uh, domain five, 
then uh, you, you still use the same model. You don't have to train uh, another model, another generator like this. So that was uh, proposed by uh, um, Professor Jagor Chu. Uh, he was a uh, professor in Korea University at that time. And now he's a professor in KAIST. So as you see, Korean guys are actually doing a lot of uh, original works in this domain. And we are really strong in uh, computer vision. So we're, that's good and bad. So we're, uh, you, you, sh you should be proud of uh, being a member of this research community. But at the same time, uh, that means uh, it's harder to get a job in Korea uh, because there are too many uh, good engineers and the scientists in this country. Anyway, so um, yeah, their main idea is enabling an image translation from and to potentially different set of labels from multiple data sets. So these five data sets, for example, they may have different set of labels and you can uh, try to use them. For example, one data set may have this kind of things like age, gender, or skin color or labels. So for example, this image is a woman and uh, this is uh, young and also having, uh, for example, light skin color. That kind of labels are available in one domain. And the other domain, uh, it has the labels like smile, angry, or surprised, like facial expressions. So you may, able to, you may be able to use these uh, different set of labels when you uh, learn this giant model, then you can flexibly apply that to generate uh, some other images in other domains more flexibly. So let's see how they do this. So the problem setting is uh, we may use multiple image data sets, and each data set may have different set of labels, as I told. And each image is labeled with a set of data set specific labels. So for example, uh, in the discriminator setting, uh, we were originally giving um, real image and fake image randomly. And it, the goal was uh, estimating uh, if that's a real or a fake image by this discriminator. So that's the same. But now they add one more thing, uh, which is domain classification. We're going to see that later. And just uh, talk about the generator first. This is similar to uh, the cycle again. So uh, starting from here, we have an input image. and we need to give another one because we have now more than two uh, target domains. We have to specify which domain we would like to send it. So uh, for example, we are going to send this to domain four. And then this generator outputs uh, some fake image, which seems like uh, the image in domain four. And then we apply the cy uh, cycle consistency as in the same manner uh, in the cycle again. So the generator receives the same generator now, receives the fake image, and we know the uh, original domain. So suppose the original domain was in domain one. So now we uh, send it back, the, the fake image in domain four to uh, domain one. And then this reconstructed image should be the same as the input image. So this is the cycle again, uh, the uh, cycle consistency loss in cycle again, right? Now, it's just one difference is we have to specify the target domain when we uh, generate it, right? And then this fake image is sent to the discriminator, and we uh, classify that if it's real and fake. But at the same time, uh, we classify which domain this image should belong to. And for that part, what's the role of this discriminator? If we uh, give some fake image in domain four, the discriminator still wants to figure out, no, this is not domain four. This was coming from domain one, and this is a fake image. So the discriminator is trained to figure out the original domain, even though uh, we are giving the fake image. And then what about the generator? It wants to fool the discriminator. So its role is generating a fake image in domain four, and this discriminator needs to be fooled by generating an uh, image um, as if it's in domain four. And this one outputs uh, domain classification as four. So they also fight to each other uh, here as well, not just real and fake. Are you following this part? Let's see its uh, mathematical formula to uh, understand that. 
So they use these three types of loss functions uh, corresponds to these three colors I mentioned here. So adversarial loss is the same. Uh, so here um, the D has uh, mark like SRC and CLS. So SRC means this head, which means uh, whether it's coming from real versus fake. That is uh, denoted as at the SRC. And the CLS uh, stands for this head. So it's the classification head, right? So in adversarial loss part, the real versus fake classifier needs to output one if we uh, train this discriminator well. So discriminator wants to maximize the score for the real image X. And if we generate a fake image from X, some image X in domain C, then whatever the domain is, the discriminator needs to figure it out. Oh, no, no, that's not an image in uh, domain C. That's from something else, uh, which is X. So it needs to output a uh, lower score, right? And the generator is trying to fooling the discriminator by creating an image real like in uh, domain C. Okay, so this part is the same as before. Just we have um, one additional parameter here. But still, just, uh, the, the role of the discriminator and the generator is the same as the original GAN. Nothing new here, okay? Then the reconstruction loss is also same as cycle GAN. The original input image X is given to uh, the generator to map it to uh, domain C, and then coming back to original domain C prime. So suppose just X was originally in C prime. Then it needs to be the same as the original image uh, X, which is uh, the cycle consistency loss or reconstruction loss in cycle again. So this one, uh, G tries to minimize this by creating an image as similar as possible to the original image X. This part is new in this model. So real image X, the discriminator uh, needs to, uh, sorry, um, yeah, D tries to maximize the score of uh, original class C prime as much as possible, given this input uh, image, real image, uh, and its original class, then the discriminator uh, needs to figure out that's real image in that domain C prime for the real images, nothing generated here. So that's just a domain classifier, given some image and the actual class, uh, the class or domain, the, the, uh, the, discriminator, the, the discriminator needs to figure out that uh, this image belongs to that class. And now we have the fake images from some generator uh, and it targets to generate an image in domain C, right? Then the discriminator tries to still maximize this, the score for this original class C prime. It wants not to be fooled. Uh, the generator wants to uh, generate image in domain C, but it still wants to figure out, no, that's not C, it's coming from C prime. That's the role of this uh, discriminator. But at the same time, the generator wants to fool the discriminator uh, to uh, generate real-like image in the domain C. And uh, in that way, actually, it tries to minimize this score as much as possible. So they uh, fight to each other, not just in the adversary loss, but also in this domain classification loss. All right? So let's see some example. So it looks... Um, complicated, but uh, it's actually the same as the previous figure. So this one is the real image we have. And we are dealing with, actually they are dealing with um, two different set of labels. One is the setup A label, which is the hair color, black, blonde, and brown, and the gender, and the age. So uh, this picture, for example, 001, that means this lady has brown hair and the male score is zero, so this is female, and young is one, so this one is actually young. So this is the label of this image in setup A data set. But because this image is coming from this data set, we don't have the labels for this other data set. 
like uh, angry, fearful, happy, sad, disgusted. These are labeled only in this uh, other domain. So we don't know these labels for this image, right? So uh, we uh, want to generate another image, uh, which is this. This one is describing. So let's see what it is. The last one, this blue box means uh, mask vector. So it's either coming from the cell of A or the RF, uh, RAFD, which means it just indicates that these labels, uh, we have to use the labels uh, from this orange box because this Im image is coming from the cell of A and we don't have the labels for this uh, green box. So this one indicates that. So green is filled with just zeros and we don't care about that, okay? So we care only about this orange box. And what does that mean? The hair color should be black and male and young. So let's transform this to male and with black hair. And given that, this generator output is this uh, image, which is makes sense, more like a male and uh, still have the long hair, but it's black. And then we know the original label of this original image, right? This is brown hair and female and young. So this is the original label. And we give the same thing. So we don't use this RF, uh, RAFD label. And this generates back uh, brown color, female, young face uh, from this one, which is this, right? And then we uh, compare these two and we give the loss uh, based on the pixel wise difference. That's the cycle consistency part. Okay, and from this fake image, what do we also do? We send it to discriminator, right? And we are going to do two things. First, uh, the dis discriminator needs to figure out that's real versus fake. And the discriminator uh, is trained to output fake because this is a fake image. And uh, also the classification, the uh, domain classification. So given this one, the uh, discriminator is trained to output the original labels, which is uh, brown hair and female. And generator wants to fool that this one actually outputs its target, like uh, male and uh, black hair. That's how we trans uh, tr uh, the train this discriminator to output these uh, labels, the classification labels. Okay. Cool. So once they have trained, then uh, using this generator, we can uh, give any input image and then we can uh, transfer it to any different uh, set of labels. So given this image, for example, we can change that to black hair, which is the same, blonde hair or brown hair, which every, every three uh, look very uh, natural. And it changes to male or aged so this is still female and this is still young. And they can also combine these different uh, combination of these uh, attributes. So hair color is changed to blonde and at the same time, the face is changed to male or uh, hair color uh, blonde plus uh, aged or uh, the gender changed to male and all three of them. So from this one, uh, the hair color changed to blonde, uh, gender changed from female to male and uh, from uh, age from young to old. So the good thing about the Stargan is that you can apply any different types of uh, labels uh, selectively and flexibly. So uh, yeah, this is quite interesting paper. Okay, so far uh, I think uh, it's easy, easy to follow, I hope. Uh, actually that's uh, relatively easier than uh, this last one. So we're going to see our very last model in this course, which is the style again. So any questions so far? Yeah, okay. So let's start our very last model. So far, our generator was a black box. We didn't talk about uh, embeddings or representation inside the model and it didn't provide any interpretability. It just generates some real-like image. Oh, wow, that's 
real life image. That's what we've done. So it takes some, some uh, vector, random vector from uh, net, uh, the normal distribution and it maps to m by n sized image. And that was just, just it. It was like a black box. So what we want to have is some generator structure with uh, some interpretation or uh, attributes, like uh, as if, if, if we have some uh, capability of slightly changing the uh, input vector or uh, within the vector, we, if we change something, then uh, what about what if we can uh, change the attributes like this? So for example, uh, making the picture a little bit older or from female to male or changing the uh, color of the hairs. If, if we can control or at least interpret, then uh, it would be much better, right? So this paper actually tried this uh, to better disentangle the latent factors, which is like gender, age, or uh, other attributes we can interpret, and uh, better interpolation properties. So given two uh, uh, attributes and something in the middle, it should be uh, semantically also something in the middle. So in this paper, they changed only the generator, not the discriminator. So it can be applied to any other GANs uh, using their standard uh, discriminator. So let's see. This is the typical generator we have worked on so far. Given some random vector, Z, it stacks uh, layers, convolution layers. And uh, basically, actually, that's deconvolution layers uh, with, uh, because the size is getting better, uh, larger. So from uh, starting from like small images like 4 by 4, uh, it upsamples once. Uh, then uh, the size becomes twice larger, like eight by eight, then 16 by 16, and so on. And inside each block, it applies some convolutions to uh, run the uh, patterns inside the, the image. So usually the typical generator has uh, repeated upsampling and convolutions, or uh, sometimes this upsampling can be uh, exchanged with the, the deconvolutions, uh, and then it's learnable. So that is uh, the gen typical generator, and we start from here. So with this, um, the generator learns some representative features at each stage. That's what uh, the CNNs usually do. Uh, each feature map at each step reflects some important aspects found in the data set. Uh, so we are training with multiple um, images in the data set. And if we represent that in 4 by 4 for example, this convolution feature needs to keep the, the essence of those uh, patterns observed in the data set, right? And if we upsample that to 8 by 8 then these con features uh, are also trained to uh, keep some useful in, uh, information to represent the images in that size, right? But we don't have any control or understanding uh, of these con features. We, uh, we didn't discuss about that yet because uh, actually that's not interpretable basically. So at these points, after uh, some layers, we, they will have some convolutional features, but what are they? We would like to uh, understand what they are learning there. And we would like to even control uh, by changing some of those variables. So uh, they try to give some macroscopic uh, style uh, injected in these um, uh, each parts. So yeah, here's their idea. Separate each feature map's overall scale and bias from the rest. What does that mean? Uh, so they force the model to learn them from in uh, two variables, which is uh, one scale variable and the other is the bias variable which is applied to every part of these uh, features. So they uh, designed some layer of this very simple layer called ADA in, which is defined as this. So what it does is whatever it receives as input, which is denoted X here, it normalizes whatever the pattern is. So this X will have some distribution, right? 
they will be uh, normalized by subtracting its mean divided by its standard deviation. This is called normalization, right? So this means they just forget the pattern, the, uh, the most important pattern in that feature space. Uh, and then it's uh, denormalized again back using y. This is the uh, scale vector and the bias vector uh, we are giving here. So uh, what it does is basically uh, forgetting the style it's learned so far. And then whatever it is, we just multiply this y instead of this uh, standard deviation. And we add this yb instead of this mu. So now it will have the average of uh, the mean will be uh, like this yb. And the standard deviation will be like this ys. Instead of, instead of the original uh, mean and uh, variation. So you don't have to know what are the scale and bias yet. I didn't talk about that yet. But uh, what we are doing here is basically just force it to forget what it has uh, learned so far, some general patterns like the mean and the variation. And now we are forcing to have, you have to have this mean and this variation by, specified by this y, OK? So then the next question should be this. What are those why? How do we train or learn them, right? So our goal is uh, um, we would like to control the style of these uh, intermediate representations it learns. So style again uses a fine transformation from the latent code. So what is a fine transformation? If you have learned some optimization course or linear algebra course, you probably have heard uh, this. So anyone can explain the difference between linear, transform uh, linear transformation, affine transformation, and convex combination. What's the difference between them? Linear combination is uh, you have some two vectors or two values, and each of them is multiplied with any uh, constant weights. So basically, it's all three are ax plus by form. You are uh, mixing uh, the vector x and y. But those weights, a and b, can be any arbitrary uh, number. Then that is called linear combination. In a fine transformation, it's a weighted average of two, var uh, two variables or two vectors. But those weights need to be summed to one. OK, ax plus by, but a and b should be summed to 1. But uh, as long as its sum is 1, it can be arbitrary number. So uh, 1 is minus 4, and the other is 5. That's also OK in a fine transformation. Convex combination also requires those weights needs to be between 0 and 1. OK, so that's the difference uh, between those three. They use uh, a fine transformation here. So that is uh, marked here. So from uh, then, a fine transformation from what? Because uh, we would like to control this generated features from something. We, we have to input something, right? So the only input we are giving is this z. So it, probably comes from uh, this Z. So that uh, that's why first connected uh, from this connection from Z to uh, this affine transformation. We're going to remove that later. But um, so uh, in short, this model forces to learn macroscopic style from data. So that's why we're coming from Z by forcing it to go through some uh, style variable called Y. And that is determined by very simple um, affine transformation from the Z. So that's their design so far, but it's not perfect yet. As the Z directly learns the, uh, from the training data, it is hard to disentangle various factors. For example, um, there are many different attributes in uh, human face. Uh, the examples may be like gender, age, or uh, hair length, or hair color or several uh, things like that. And we know that they are quite correlated. For example, males usually have short uh, hair, and females have tends to have longer hairs. 
it's really rare to collect images with the uh, male face with longer hairs, right? They are quite correlated, but they are actually independent, uh, biologically speaking, right? Male still have uh, long hair, but just people don't do that. So uh, we don't have the, uh, much data like that, just it. But uh, we know that um, that's independent and we also want the model to learn it from uh, the data. So we'd like to actually disentangle those different independent um, variables. So uh, in, we, instead of directly connecting from Z to A, uh, we're going to actually see some visualization of that to better understand it. We learned some intermediate latent code, which is called W. Uh, so instead of Z, directly connecting from Z, we have some intermediate variable called W. And then that W is determined from the, this Z. But it now goes through the fully connected layers so that those attributes, uh, it can learn that those attributes are not uh, dependent on each other. Even though there are correlation in the data set, Still, we would like to learn those are independent attributes using these fully connected layers. That this is actually the main idea of this paper. They, they introduce this intermediate uh, code, W, and that is different from Z by adding these fully connected layers. And now uh, we can remove the uh, first FC layer and uh, connection from Z. So this part is disconnected and Z now can affect this generation process only going through this W. We don't have any di direct connection from Z to uh, this generation uh, network, okay? Then they also added some noise to generate some stochastic, uh, stochastically different images all the time. So some noise is added and that also helps to make this model more robust. Okay, so yeah, I know this is not easy to follow. Uh, if you don't understand this, please read the paper. And uh, also you can uh, watch this video after this uh, lecture. So this slide actually explains what that disentanglement means. So I uh, mentioned that hair length and the gender is not biologically uh, correlated but that is just affected by the distribution of the data we collect. So if we collect uh, the images just from the nature, uh, suppose this is gender, male and female, and this is uh, uh, long hair and short hair. So this part, male with long hair, we have much fewer instances in the data set. So the distribution of the features in the training data set may look like this. But if we map it to uh, the Z, uh, which follows the normal distribution without any control, what does it do is it tries to uh, maximally take advantage of this space to reflect these images observed in the training data set. So it does not uh, keep the shape of this like that. It just fills out uh, with these yellowish and the bluish and the violet images like this uh, to maximally use this uh, Z space. So now, uh, what about, uh, we, can, we cannot distinguish uh, given some vector uh, that indicates uh, more like female versus male or long hair versus short hair. They are entangled in one uh, space. And they introduce W, which maps from this Z to that space then this new space uh, actually can learn uh, the distribution of those different attributes and they can kind of recover this uh, distribution using those fully connected layers. So yeah, this is the example, long haired males are rare or missing here. Uh, and the unseen combination disappears in Z to pre prevent the sampling of invalid com uh, combinations. If we, uh, if we yeah. And then um, the W successfully undoes this warping. And uh, now we can sample any combinations of uh, hair lengths and the gender uh, once we uh, transform it to W, more like independently. So this is the example of the style again. Um, so 
the reference is given, and they try to change the uh, style uh, at different levels because they now have the uh, ADA in uh, layer is injected in everywhere, and we can change their uh, style vector of two variables freely to reflect some uh, other styles. So if we inject the styles learned from this image at the course level, which is uh, four by four or eight by eight layers, we just apply the style vector of this one to these images, then we got this. So at the course level, uh, the overall uh, shape uh, actually follows uh, this reference image. If we just change the fine grained styles uh, in the end, then uh, it governs more like the uh, shape of the face or uh, the uh, shape of the eye or nose and the mouth and something like that. But um, you can see the difference. Uh, I mean, uh, background or overall structure follows more like the original uh, reference image. So yeah, this start, uh, style again model enables to change the styles at the different level of uh, granularity. And uh, we can freely uh, um, change the style to something else like this. All right, uh, after this Stargen paper, actually they uh, published another version, Stargen V2. And uh, also after that, they, uh, they have the advanced version of the disentanglements, uh, which is quite interesting to read, but uh, I'm not going to deal with uh, that in this class. And this is the end of our long journey. So thanks for all of your efforts and participation so far. Uh, I actually know that uh, I heard from many students directly or indirectly that, yeah, this course was really demanding and uh, we covered a lot of materials. So thanks for surviving and thanks for your hard work in homeworks and the projects. I know you guys are not done yet, but uh, yeah. Anyway, thanks for um, taking this course and it was my great pleasure to um, meet you and give you a lecture. I'm. I'm really sorry to actually miss any chance to uh, meet you guys in person. Uh, last semester, I was able to do that at least during the presentation day, but this semester I can't. So uh, that's, um, yeah, that's sad, but uh, yeah, it was great to meet you at least online and thanks for participation. And last but not least, uh, I prepared some end of semester survey. So. This is not the official uh, survey by the school, but uh, I personally do this to collect your opinions or ideas about the course or suggestions. Please feel free to say anything. This is uh, either anonymous or you can write your name. It's up to you. So I require you to write your name, but you can write any random name there if you don't want to disclose uh, it's you. So in that case, I cannot uh, figure out who is who. So. Uh, don't worry about anonymity. And please feel free to provide any feedback that I can improve this uh, course further for the next semester. Uh, and yeah, thanks. Um, and uh, prepare for the final exam. And we're going to have the final exam on the Monday, as I announced. And in the, uh, the upcoming week, we meet, we'll meet again in this uh, Google Meet to have the final presentations. OK, so thank you. And uh, any question before we finish? Any comments, suggestions? OK. Um, OK, I'm gone. Ah, uh, 그냥 수업 관련한 질문 그냥 해도 될까요? Ah, uh, 그거 녹화 끝나고 할게요. Ah, uh, 네. Okay, so it seems you don't have any comments. So let's finish and uh, let's meet in 13th for the presentation. <laughs>